morning, everyone, and um, thank you all very much for being here. I feel very honoured that people um, are signing up for this um, session. And um, I, I'm a bit mystified <laughs> that I ended up here on screen talking to you all about my story. And I'll say a little bit about how that came about. Um, we were going to have a, we were going to try this platform for our community day. And um, we were all going to write a little abstract so that we could put together a, a session where several of us would present something short. And so um, I sort of prevaricated on this for quite some time until I think a couple of days before our meeting. And, and then Panf wrote this list of questions that had come up for me um, as I was contemplating the topic of listening and how do we listen in mind, body, healthcare or in whole person healthcare. And um, the result of that was that everyone said, um, wow, that's really interesting and, um, and we want to hear more. And I said, well, it's only taken me 10 years to get to this place with all these questions. So I think it was Josie who initially suggested that um, maybe I should tell that story and then come to the question. So here we are, um, me sharing my story. <laughs> Um, and for me, the purpose of this session isn't actually about my story. Um, it's also not specifically about looking for um, finite answers to these questions that have come out of this story. Um, and for me, it's um, some of this is to do with um, a poem, well, something a poem by David White that really speaks to me about these questions. So I'd like to just read a, an excerpt from that poem. The poem is called Sometimes and I start somewhere in the in the middle and it goes like this. Questions conceived out of nowhere but in this place beginning to lead everywhere. Questions to stop, requests to stop what you are doing right now and to stop what you are becoming while you do it. Questions that can make or unmake a life. Questions that have patiently waited for you. Questions that have no right to go away. That poem really speaks to me um, and um, I hope it will become clear as I start sharing my my story. And so I will now start sharing my screen. Um, I'll just have to see if I remember how to do that. Here it goes. Now you can click on that screen so that you um, see a larger version of that, which click double click on that. So that's what I've done. Um, and I need to do the That's it. Okay, so actually my story, uh, I realized when I was thinking about this, did not start 10 years ago, um, but actually, I mean a long time ago, you can go back and back and back, but the, the impetus for, for this story started about 17 years ago. Um, 17 years ago I had a, a malignant tumor removed uh, from my abdomen and um, I was looking for alternative approaches to address all the domains of who I was, who I am, because I thought I don't know where this tumor has come from and if my internal environment has created this tumor then I need to change this environment in some way so it's not going to come back. Um, and um, after lots of searching I found um, a program called Creating Health and that was um, a program that Bev Sylvester Clark ran. It was a whole person mind-body um, healthcare program and it sadly no longer exists but it was um, incredibly moving and inspiring and encompassing. It was a 12-week program and I actually participated in that several times also um, 
the uh, level two. And then at some point, um, Bev said, I'm thinking of training people to become trainers with me. And this is what happened. And I asked her, would she consider me? And she went, yes. And literally, I was so happy that I went dancing and yahooing and laughing and feeling totally excited about the possibility in my house. I can feel it like yesterday. I was on my own in the house when I got her message. And I was, you know, literally doing this little dance in my hallway and in my lounge. So, yeah. That's where it started. I thought, yes, this is um, what I want to do. But here was me as an occupational therapist um, with most of my experience in residential aged care, uh, mainly because that allowed me an opportunity to, um, to earn enough as a, as a single mother and to work um, school hours so that I could be there for my kids before and after school. Um, and some of that was in a, a dementia care facility called Seedrome. And so I thought, how credible would that be for working in uh, primary health care uh, in the community health? And, um, and so I felt um, like I didn't have enough knowledge skills, not enough confidence, not an appropriate background, etc., etc. And this is a bit of a theme for me about not, you know, not having enough, not knowing enough, not whatever, not enough. So um, I decided I needed more training. And so in, um, um, and, and more, more knowledge about mind-body healthcare and um, all of that. So, in 2008, I managed to um, get employed by AUT in the occupational therapy department because I, I'm an occupational therapist. Um, and then in 2010, I started, I found out that um, AUT actually offered a mind-body healthcare program, which I, was, I wasn't aware of, and I was just totally inspired by, so I started doing that. Um, one of the big challenges for that was that it was an inter interprofessional approach to with all people in practice, in healthcare practice, and we were expected to bring this into our own work context. And I struggled majorly to find a way to bring this whole person healthcare practice into my work as a fieldwork coordinator for students on placement and lecturer. Um, so, and yeah, so how was I going to do that? Eventually, I found a way to make sense of that, and I did a thesis in um, um, uncovering the experience of lecturers who use mindfulness practice for themselves while they're teaching. Because I came to the understanding that um, being a whole person healthcare practitioner, you really need to be fully present, authentic, compassionate, be able to listen and to respond and I thought the only way that I can teach that best is to by, is by modeling that to my students or to the students. Um, and I remember before I joined the, um, the course I had a chat with, with Brian because I had already been a mindfulness practitioner for many years before that, it's like almost two decades and, um, and we had a conversation about that, and, my, and Brian basically said, um, hmm, I don't want this all to be about mindfulness. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, we'll see. <laughs> um, and for me, mindfulness has been a, a hugely important whole person, mind-body practice. And if you're not a natural in easily building social relationships through easy and open communication and you need to learn how to do that for, and, and to become aware of yourself to be authentically present. Um, that's been a hugely important and beneficial skill. Um, so yes, all of that sounds um, really wonderful. And um, this is how I ended up working full time in a really challenging role. Um, before me, the, um, the department had gone through several people in that role. They didn't last longer than two years max. And 
ended up having done that role for nine years and then doing um, postgraduate study, doing a master's next to it, and I was absolutely spent by the end of that. Um, one of the benefits, um, and, and at the same time, I still thought I didn't know enough. <laughs> So in the in the middle of all that, I also embarked on uh, becoming a mindfulness-based stress reduction trainer. Um, but at the same time, I was also um, uh, preparing myself for a big adventure because AUT had the option of signing up for a contract for a, a, a scheme where you could um, work for two years for 80% of your salary and then you could take six months off on that 80%, on that same 80%. So what did I do? I spent three of those six months after finishing my um, master's walking Te Ararawa, which is the long pathway that actually goes from um, Cape Reinga to Bluff, but I didn't do all of that. I only <laughs> walked the South Island um, from the tip of the South Island, the start of the um, uh, what's it called Queen, Queen Charlotte Track down to Bluff, and that was three months of the most awe-inspiring, stunningly beautiful physically and mentally taxing and exhilarating backcountry New Zealand landscapes. And I did that with two friends. And I was, my heart was just soaringly happy. And numerous times during those three months, I would turn to my friends and I would go, have I told you how excited I am that we are doing this? And so this was absolutely amazing. Um, I've never, by the end of it anyway, I've never been so strong, fit and healthy in my life. I've never been so scared at times of falling to my death or worse, permanent disability. I've never felt so connected and so aware of how every part of us is nature and of humanity's utter dependence on the natural world. We are absolutely interbeing um, with our environment, with our natural environment, with other people. We are part of it. We are not separate. Also, I have never felt so accepted without any fear of judgment and never felt so, I so belonged to a group of people from all sorts of different backgrounds and ages all doing the same thing, namely walking the length of New Zealand. There was absolutely no issue with whether you were black or white or old or young or where you came from or what you, what you did for a living. It was completely irrelevant. We were all there just soaking up this amazing adventure and this amazing um, natural environment, stunningly beautiful away from everywhere, some places you couldn't get to without walking for three days. And um, yeah, so walking that uh, made me realize that actually my life was more than about working my guts out for a huge organization that its only function is to, to uh, kind of in some way, its only function is to maintain itself. <laughs> And whether I was there or not was it was completely irrelevant. Somebody would take my place if I wasn't there. So um, I decided that I wanted to spend more time doing what gave me such joy and happiness. And I wanted to bring a greater proportion of my life to actual healthcare practice rather than teaching it. Um, so I... Um, yeah, I, I contacted my, my boss and said, actually, you know what, I don't want to come back full time. I'm happy to be at AUT for longer, but not in the way that I have been. So she said, come and talk to me when you're back um, and we'll see what comes out of that. So um, during those remaining months, and I spent two and a half months in, um, in Europe where my family is, all of my family, my daughter is there and my 
my mother was. She died a year and a half ago. And um, uh, yeah, so my, my brothers and sisters are there. So everyone was there. And so I spent time there too. And as I was doing that, when I came back to New Zealand, I had another month to just be. I mean, the luxury of all that was just unbelievable. And during that time off, I had so many ideas of what I wanted to do after full-time AUT work. I had so many ideas, there were way too many, and I had no idea where to start. So eventually I came to the conclusion just I needed to go back to work and finish the rest of the year in my crazy role because it wasn't possible to change that mid-year and um, and start something new in 2017. So around about the time that I came back to AUT, just before that, I became aware of another organization and another experience that has shaped my life since then amazingly. And that is an organization or a group of people, it's not really an organization, um, called Mindfulness for Change. I found out, um, I got an email from somebody saying, oh, there's a mindfulness gathering in Wellington and um, here, you know, you go if you want to. And um, I thought it was a follow-up of um, a, a meeting that I'd been to the year before in Dunedin of mindfulness facilitators and people interested in mindfulness and healthcare. So I went along and it was nothing like what I had ever experienced before. Um, it was a, it's a community of people committed to generating social change from the bottom up based on um, a mindful approach plus a whole lot of other um, technologies, um, philosophies. So I'm not sure if you can read that properly, but um, I'll read it out for you. Mindfulness for Change is a network of people and communities committed to serving human experience by facilitating relationships with self, other people in the world. We support each other to develop projects and relationships that benefit the well-being of people and the planet. And um, it was such an amazing experience. Again, people from all over New Zealand, there were 40 of us there that first, um, first hurry from all over New Zealand, from all walks of life. There were ex-lawyers, there were doctors, nurses, social workers, psychologists, artists, IT programmers, community development developers, mindfulness trainers, people from the corporate world, all with an interest in mindfulness to affect change in the world. And they're all ages from 18 to people um, in their 50s, 60s. So what I experienced there was absolutely unique. I hadn't ever experienced that before anywhere else. It was a group. They were um, committed to completely different way of doing stuff in the world, um, non-hierarchical. They co-created their gatherings that was based on an invitation for each person to share their gifts, no matter what those gifts were. They're co-creating their community from the grassroots up and based on truly welcoming um, each person into a space of kindness and safety. And manakitanga, which is a Maori word for um, creating community, supporting each other, lifting others up, um, is the foundation for all of their interactions. And um, yeah, expliciting, explicitly inviting people to share their resources, their skills, their knowledge, um, and supporting each other to do what each person wanted to offer to the world. And the caliber of the young people there and what they brought and how aware they were and what their, um, what their aspirations were for the world that they're facing absolutely blew my mind. And I wasn't the only older person who experienced that. Um, and, and numbers of initiatives have come out of this group. They have organized um, several hui since then, and I went to several of them, and I was so taken with this that 
I actually wanted some of this in Auckland. Um, so I um, um, so yeah, I became the main driver for the Auckland group of Mindfulness for Change, and I co-organized for HUI in the Auckland region. And I'll say a little bit more about that shortly as well. So that was kind of in the background. That was the, the start of uh, me coming back to work at AUT. And in the same week that I started back to work in 2016, um, somebody came up to me and said, um, we know that you, you, know, you have knowledge in mindfulness and um, teaching mindfully. Would you um, teach the staff mindfulness practice? So because of my experience with mindfulness for change, I felt actually, yes, I do have some, I, I do have some, ability to maybe do that you know if if these young people can do some of the things that they were doing in the world surely i can offer an introduction to mindfulness course to the staff anyway so as they say i never looked back i've been offering those courses um since then on a regular basis to staff and i've been doing the same to students and um all very small scale um very grassroots level which i love um yeah, so to continue the story with um, about Mindfulness for Change, in October 2019, a little group of us, about four or five of us, organized another HUI um, that was in um, Huya in Auckland, in the West Coast. And it was about um, bringing people together who wanted to live a new normal now in the face of global warming and um, um, environmental degradation. And we were really aware that there's a lot of anxiety with younger people, with a lot of people about the world as it is. And so we wanted to bring people together who were already, who wanted to be supported and who wanted to be inspired and who wanted to make connections and maybe work together um, to start doing these little changes. Um, and from that, I, from that experience, I realized that um, I needed to start right where I am. So there was a couple of stories that stood out uh, from people sharing their stories and one of them was one woman who lives in Auckland in Point Chev and she said oh when I moved into my house I started connecting with my neighbors and you know we're doing all sorts of stuff together now we've got a real little community going and um, and there was another person who <coughs> runs a business um, hiring out worm farms <laughs> to help with uh, soil regeneration and um, to me that really linked with um, my experience of the Tiara where I felt such a connection with the earth and felt so integrated uh, integrate <laughs> the wrong word um, totally part of the earth and if we don't have decent soil then we're not going to have decent food and if we don't um, start making food locally, then we're going to be running out of um, running out of space to actually grow food for enough people. So some of that at the end of 2019, so all of this is kind of accelerating until we come to now, um, I made a commitment to develop my own garden, to regenerate my own soil under my feet, to grow food resilience, um, water resilience, and I'll say a bit more about that, and to build local community resilience and connection. And again, this word interbeing comes to mind for me. So at the beginning or at the end of last year, the beginning of this year, I started um, connecting with a whole lot of organizations yes through facebook i mean we all know how um how odious facebook can be and it's been a, a, a real opportunity for me to really 
find lots of people in the world who are doing amazing stuff to um, yeah, to heal the planet, to heal the world, to heal people. And so I'm, um, I've kind of linked with um, the Compost Collective in New Zealand and the Make Soil organization worldwide. And I had a little uh, business called Blue Borage. He's supporting people to grow their own food and to make compost and all that stuff. And around about the same time, we really became aware of um, the school strikes for climate and extinction rebellion became a thing and um, and I found a book um, a man called um, Daniel Wow who wrote this book designing regenerative cultures so I read that from cover to cover and then over Christmas last year I read this book um, the permaculture city Regenerative design for urban, suburban, and town resilience. And again, I read it from cover to cover, and it absolutely um, inspired me. I had thought I'd been interested in um, in permaculture for many years when I was in my early twenties, and then, of course, you know, life happened, and you know, moved from Holland to New Zealand, had kids, work, pay the mortgage, all that stuff, and so it became part of the background of my life. And now that my children have grown and they're doing their own thing, my family is all in Holland, what am I going to do with my life? Um, I'm not, I was not interested in thinking about retirement and going on, you know, traveling the world and just making myself feel comfortable. So this was like, yes, this is what I want to do. I want to contribute to my own community right from where I am. So as part of that, I had become aware of um, an organization called Neighborhood Support. And I'd made some inquiries and I decided that yes, I would become a street contact and start to um, build community in my own street. I, had I have lived in this street for 35 years and because my kids went to school somewhere outside of the area, I worked outside of the area. Most of my friends live outside of the area, so I really didn't know anyone very much. When my children were little, um, there was quite a, a little community just at the end of my cul-de-sac where I live. But after that, I didn't really know very many people other than the people right next to me. So that's what I did. I thought that's a legitimate way. There's the same old thing again, you know, who am I to be saying to my local community, let's go and do something together. But I thought, well, neighborhood support, it's about safety and about looking out for each other. It's a national organization. So I can do that. I have something, there's a, a system to back me up. So that's what I did, and I started uh, putting out uh, leaflets to say, sign up and let's make this an awesome community. And then, um, kind of the proverbial hit the fan, basically. I mean, we had all the dreadful fires in, in, um, in Australia. Um, we, um, COVID kind of happened. Uh, the Black Lives Matter, uh, what sparked all that happened um, as part of the AUT, um, our, our program, we are very um, strong on um, ensuring that our students are um, responsive uh, partners in the treaty um, allyship. And so we were going to have the person who um, co-organized or is the main mover and shaker of this, um, the Titiriti Futures, an anti-racism conference. Um, she was going to run a workshop for our students and then of course COVID happened and so we couldn't run the workshop. And um, it all went online. And I mean, some of these things are, are big systemic issues, including the inequalities in the world, that some people have so much and some people, other people have so little. Um, the notion of white supremacy, the notion of white privilege, the notion of white fragility, um, 
structural racism. Um, so all of that really, yeah, it really affected me and I, I felt, you know, that part of the Mindfulness for Change kind of impetus was to actually contribute to doing something about this. Um, and from my experience of Mindfulness for Change, I know that small grassroots change is possible. Some of the initiatives that have come out of that community have been awe-inspiring. Um, and there's not, not time to actually kind of go into any detail of that. But um, so in the context of all of that, for me, it's also more and more important that whatever I will do is accessible to ordinary everyday people who live in ordinary everyday suburbs like mine. A lot of them pay through the nose to have a rented roof over their heads in service of someone else's retirement nest egg. And even saying that, it makes me feel <laughs> um, very upset and very angry that this is the world that we live in. So here I was, basically, before, just before, during and after lockdown, interested in hyperlocal learning and, um, and kind of organizing and hosting workshops on composting, pruning, seed sowing and water collection systems in my garden. So there are people that are, you know, you have to go to places to learn about these things. And I thought, well, I'm learning about these things. I may as well invite people to learn with me. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Building skills and building connections, building community, um, doing stuff that makes me feel good, healthy, well connected and like I belong somewhere. Um, and all of this is happening against the backdrop of my professional background as an occupational therapist. Um, when I started doing the Mind Body course, it was all about um, kind of healing people's disease. And, and I had difficulty finding a way, where does that link with occupational therapy? Because occupational therapy often looks at, okay, this is the situation that you find yourself in. Let's see how we can support you to live a meaningful life. Doing, you know, helping you to maybe um, improve the way or change the way you do things, maybe change your environment or change what you do altogether so that you can then live a life of meaning and contribution and participation in life. And so that felt to me like it had a different kind of flavor, even though the outcome may be very similar. You may not be um, uh, resolving symptoms, but we are supporting people to live a meaningful life and to feel healthy and well and connected. And then, so now that I'm doing all this other stuff, <laughs> I'm starting to feel more and more connected to my profession again. All of this is whole person healthcare through occupation. Occupation is all the things we need to, we want to, and we are expected to do, and through human occupation. And so with realizing that, I also realized that the whole person healthcare approach has been happening at my dementia care facility where I've been working for three, day, three hours a week f since 2001, f literally for decades. So um, often I felt mildly kind of less than when I say I'm working at a dementia care facility because how can that be whole person healthcare? How can that be healing illness? Because people with advanced dementia aren't going to get better. So I want to share a little bit about this facility and I, I was hoping that the manager of the facility was going to be able to be part of this session, but she sadly had to work today because there was no RN on duty. And um, these are some photos taken of that facility and I will, I will say its name because it is absolutely amazing and I feel privileged to work there. Sometimes I say to them, you know, I should be paying you for the, for the privilege of working there. Fortunately, they don't take me up on that. Um, so the blurb on the website is just the blurb, you know, 
it's just words really um, but what is so incredible about it is um, the experience of being there working at this facility and seeing and feeling what's created there by by the manager um, because she sees she sees uh, the community she sees people's gifts uh, she sees the people's strengths she sees the the slightest little bit of of happiness of responsiveness to um, what's going on um, for each resident this is a, a kind of a rest home dementia area and a hospital and she thinks that's important we spend lots of time um, thinking and talking about each individual resident and um, it's about working as a team and every team member works with the residents um, and every team member gets involved gets invited to work with a resident if they have a particular connection with that person um, if they have a particular skill that is being able to be utilized so this is not about fancy buildings this is not about shouting from the rooftops like some of the big um, corporate organizations you know we are the leading provider of dementia care this is about everyone in this facility knowing that they belong that they are safe that they are seen and that they are appreciated for who they are and able to share their unique gifts that includes the residents there's one man who walks around the whole day kind of head down spitting um, kind of almost uh, purposeless and yet he can play um, blues on his guitar and so once a week he plays blues um, on his guitar and everyone sits and loves it so it's that kind of thing interbeing in action community well-being in action and it's from having lived all of these experiences that I think my questions have value and so I'm going to share the questions with you shortly um, I look forward to seeing where we may go with them in this session um, and while I have no specific answers I do have a dream <laughs> I am working on actively developing this into some sort of reality and for me it's about a community an urban community well-being hub so here I am I've said it now um, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I want to read out my questions so I'm asking you to really kind of listen deeply to not know or look for any answers for now um, I've been listening for the questions my questions that seem to be conceived out of nowhere but in this place beginning to lead everywhere to quote David White for a long time now and my life has continued to open and open and open more as a result of that so I invite you to listen for your own questions also that may be arising from your story that may be stimulated by my questions may be triggered by your own memories of your own life experiences and after I read these questions out to you I'll hand us over to Karen to direct us to the next part of the um, <clears throat> of the session so I'm going to unfollow that and I'm going to just read my questions okay oh, I'm taking rather a long time here sorry about that so the questions do we listen for the person's contact in our whole person context in our whole person um, interactions their interbeing with their physical environment at home or at work how this impacts on their well-being do we listen for their interbeing with their cultural background their spiritual values and practices how they see and experience the world do we listen for their interbeing nature with the land under their feet <coughs> Do we listen for their interbeing, their sense of belonging with their community of people around them, their family, their friends, colleagues? 
do we ask or even listen for what is important to this whole person? Do we listen for what they do or don't do in their everyday lives that is important to them? Do we listen for what all these activities mean to them? How they do them and with whom? Do we listen for what impact those activities or people have on their health and well-being? Do we listen to what resources this whole person has that they are already or not yet accessing? Do we listen for what we include in our perspective of this person's non-duality? Where does the non-duality of this person end and the rest of the world, their world, our world, begin? Do we explore or at least acknowledge what impact the world as we all co-create it has on the health and well-being of this whole person in front of us? Such as effects of colonization, structural racism, environmental degradation, inequality, poverty, climate change, COVID or the threat of the next pandemic, to name but a few. What part of that world is not part of this person's health? Do we listen for who is able to access our services and whose social, cultural, institutional or physical environment simply doesn't support or enable them to access our services? Do we listen for how our privilege impacts on how we listen and what we listen for? Thank you.